It is my distinct pleasure to uh, kick off an evening. It's going to be a wild ride, so strap in tight. Uh, and I would like to introduce first uh, Johnny R. Lee, who's a spiritual and cultural advisor for the Salish Kootenai tribes, uh, people from here. And um, he not just works on and, and thinks about our relationship to nature, but uh, he's also involved in endangered languages, his own, and uh, trying to uh, help educate young people about speaking Salish and what it means and the cultural connections. So delighted to uh, have Johnny here uh, with us to share a few remarks at the beginning. And then uh, David, uh, Dr. David Madsen, who is in, uh, my husband, uh, is, is, has more experience than uh, most anyone in terms of field work, really looking at what bears and also mountain lions do in the wild and, and just wild nature generally. Uh, he did a share of uh, involved in collaring and following and mostly following, but, uh, but he's really thought deeply and he has uh, positions um, with MIT and uh, Yale and Northern Arizona University. Uh, and he's not just a science guy, cross science guy, he's actually got uh, a background in the policy sciences, which he teaches as well. So uh, if you hear a science guy talking about the importance of what goes on between <coughs> your ears, it's because David actually thinks about um, such things. So uh, without further ado, Johnny R. Lee, thank you. Hello, everybody. I can't see, so I'm going to take off my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Be here on behalf of my brother, the grizzly, and all the other animals. <clears throat> to start off with, I'd like to say a, a little prayer for for all the animal world out there that some we squash, some we slap, you know. But uh, they all have a spirit. They all have a gift. So we'll ask the Creator for blessing for all of us here for understanding. Utlut some hagen. So it's chess, the emps, a beam. Quillit in the moose. Come shake your queen, quidden sutin. Quick so. So um, she et qua, exor, shield, ketsia. Kex and sukun em, tun kudlemis, so it's ya, we quay you. My prayer for the great grandfather, the creator spirit. For our brothers and sisters out there, the animal world, for protection today, to come and intervene on what's going on in the endangered species at this time. It's the grizzly that's up on the, on the board. So we asked the Creator to give us a heart Give an understanding for all our leaders in the, in the world here that they too can have, have a heart to, to have a concern for all the animal world. Thank you, my creator. Tonight, it's kind of difficult in a way to talk about cultural things of Indian people under connecting lives with the animal world. It goes back way, way back from the legends and the stories that we received from our elders, the stories that was passed down from their elders. And it goes on to this generation as we pass it on, the stories. You're always taught to listen to never interfere when someone speaks. You listen until you have a time, a break, and there to, 
to say your comments. In this world today, we're all kind of confused. We're scared of animals. We're afraid to go out in the woods. But a long time ago, there was trust. In the first creation of world, it was destroyed. And then another, the flood came, destruction. Then the creator created animal world and instructed all the animals that they had a purpose to do, to prepare the world for the coming of the human beings. And when time came when human being was to come into the world, the animals all had their meeting. And they said they were gonna go to different places and wait for a human being to find them that they had something to give them. So our human beings that came into the world <clears throat> were taught through visions, taught of medicine, the plants that grow, how to use these medicines to heal, the berries that we picked, the fish that swam, the clean water that we have, the rock spirits, the tree spirits, the birds, and the fresh air, everything. We had the four, the four uh, what am I looking for here? It's hard to speak English, you know. <laughs> <coughs> uh, or something, I know there's something, but, but no, no, El elements, huh? the four elements, there you go, fire, water, air, and Mother Earth, the four elements, we never mess with them, you mess with fire, you're going to get hurt, you mess with the water, you're going to get hurt, you mess with the air, you're not going to breathe much. And Mother Earth has everything here on it that we, we protect. And this is how we were raised a long time ago, that we don't disturb the plants that grow. We can look at them and study them, but not to dig them up. If we dig them up, it was for medical uses and stuff in our food. Fire. We need fire in the right way. The air is being dis destroyed a lot, as we can tell today, with all of the air pollution. And the world is changing, the climate, global warming. Through all of this, with these animals, when they were out there, they had all of these gifts. And as a child, when you were raised, you were raised to speak the truth that everything from your heart was the truth. You never lied. So you were taken for your word when you grew up. When you said something, it was number one, your word. That's how the Indian people signed a treaty a long time ago with their, with their word. And the treaties have been broken. There was a treaty here for the grizzly bears maybe three years ago, the tribes from all nations signed this treaty. And today we're right here close to getting delisted. The grizzly bear was important in that animal world. As that child grew up at 12 years old, with all the teachings that he's had to be honorable, be be proud, be strong, good hunter. Twelve years old, he was already con considered an adult. A young adult, twelve years old. Can you imagine today, twelve years old, 
to leave your child at home to take care of the home and go on a vacation, come home? No, not much, huh? Even a 35-year-old boy. Huh? So the, the teachings a long time ago were very strict for the native people, their beliefs to respect everything. All the animal world, everything that that grows, the little bugs that crawl. We teach our children, don't play with them. You can look at them, go. You can look at them, but don't, don't, don't bother them. And they learn, they remember this. And we need to reteach all of our people to have that heart for our brothers. The animals took care of us all for a long time. It's our turn now to protect them, to, to take care of them, to help them. And this is the world that we're in today at this final stages of decision from the judge. I hope his word is do not disturb. And this is what I'm, I'm supporting here as a cultural person, native person, and we're on a dis disabled list here too, we're very few of the cultural people. And we need this to keep surviving, to share with everybody, to everybody to learn. And I think at this time, I, I, I'd like to, to really turn it over to David. He's, he's done a lot of this study with the grizzly bear, the other animals, he was raised in the Black Hills with the Sioux people there, so he knows the heart of the Indian people. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Dave Matson, please. Well, thank you, Johnny. That was, uh, that was great. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer that uh, all of us humans are creatures of story. And um, I don't think I'm any different as a scientist. Um, I think we scientists tell stories. And so that's what I'm going to try to do here tonight. Um, hopefully in an engaging way. Uh, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of science geeky kind of stuff. Um, but I hope not in a way that's tedious. And it's about two species that have long fascinated me, uh, bison and grizzly bears. Um, I first became acquainted with the two in relationship with each other in uh, the Yellowstone ecosystem back in 1979 when I first started doing field work studying grizzly bears. And it's taken literally decades for this talk to gestate, uh, to take the form that you're going to see tonight, um, sharing what it is I think I know about these two species and uh, their long history together in all places on earth that they have occupied together going back into the ice ages. So um, before I go any further though, I would like to acknowledge the sponsors of tonight's event, uh, Grizzly Times and the International Wildlife Film Festival. But as is my want, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground. I'm going to lay out a lot of threads, and I'm going to try to weave them back together into a, a kind of a coherent fabric. But uh, given the amount of ground I'm going to try to cover, it probably behooves me to lay out a bit of a road map so you can anticipate where I'm heading. But starting out with sort of this foundational notion that bison is a lot of things, but amongst those things, it's bear food. And uh, much of what we know about that is based on studies we've done in Yellowstone, which is the only place where we still have bison and grizzly bears together. Thence, I'm going to start on a journey through history, um, back in the Ice Ages, tracing um, the places 
and the times where, uh, where, where bison and grizzlies shared space. Then into the Holocene, our current warm epic. Thence into the Anthropocene, what some people call the Anthropocene, an era that started a couple of centuries ago um, with the dominance of Earth ecosystems by humans. And then come back to Yellowstone again at the end because it is in Yellowstone that we have the cradle of what opportunities we might have, any future prospects we might have for these two species and their continuing journey. So starting with bison as bear food, and in fact, bison is bear food. And as I said, um, just about everything we know about this connection we learned in Yellowstone. And to put that in a bit of a geospatial context, everything that you see in pink on this map is current dis grizzly bear distribution. Dark pink is core distribution, light pink is peripheral distribution, and this is straddling the Canada-US border, as you can see. And then overlay on that every place that we have bison, and as you can see, it's pretty straightforward, about the only place where we have significant numbers of bison, together with significant numbers of grizzly bears, is in the Yellowstone ecosystem. So we're fortunate in having studied this connection between bears and grizzlies over uh, a long period of time in the Yellowstone area. I was uh, part of these studies between 1979 and 1993, but based on our investigations, we learned a lot of stuff about grizzlies and about the connection between bears and bison. Uh, first of all, we came up with an estimate of the amount of biomass that bears consumed, at least in terms of the meat they consumed, from the different ungulate species in this ecosystem. And given the numbers of elk in the ecosystem at the time, it's not surprising that a slight majority of the meat they eat, ate they got from elk, followed by bison, followed by moose, a surprisingly large amount given the relatively few numbers of moose in the ecosystem, very little from livestock, virtually none at all from mule deer. Now the point to be made here, just on the basis of these simple numbers, is that, a, that grizzly bears obtained a disproportionate amount of meat from bison relative to the numbers of bison in the ecosystem at that time. So that alone flags bison as um, a potentially important source of food for bears. As to how grizzlies got meat from these various species, uh, looking at the percent they obtained by predation. Similar percentages from elk and moose, near half from outright predation. But in contrast to that, when we look at the bovines, bison and cattle, virtually none at all. And so by subtraction, then most of the meat they ate from bison they got by scavenging. And that's because grizzly bears aren't dumb. <laughs> <clears throat> bison are truly formidable prey. They're large, they're well-armed, they're aggressive. Moreover, they live in open habitats that complicates the ambush predation that grizzly bears tend to favor. And they live in herds and engage in collective defense, not only of themselves, but of their calves. So, Grizzly bears then need to basically wait until bison tip over dead, and they tip over dead for all sorts of reasons. Um, they tip over dead from starvation and de disease during the winter, available as carrion then on winter ranges the following spring. They die from birthing complications during April and during May. Um, for bulls, they die from rut-related injuries starting in August, and increasingly um, there's carrion from wolf kills. So the focus here is on scavenging, carrion, and it turns out that most of what bears eat and ate, they obtained as carrion on winter ranges. So the focus then is on winter ranges, and here you're looking at a map of elk and bison ranges, winter ranges, in the Yellowstone ecosystem. The dusky green are elk, win uh, elk winter ranges, red are bison winter ranges, and some of those areas also hosted or supported a significant number of elk. But uh, with those winter ranges in mind then, we went in and in all of the areas delineated by dashed yellow lines, 
we established transects that we visited repeatedly during a given year, year after year. And based on that fairly in-depth inquiry into what bears were doing on winter ranges, we learned a lot. But in the end, what we learned was relatively straightforward. It had a lot to do with the different amounts of edibles available on different types of carcasses. Not surprisingly, there's a lot more meat for a bear to eat on the carcass of an average adult bison, anywhere from four to five times more edibles. And so then when you look at the amount of time it would take for the entire suite of scavengers to consume roughly 50% of those edibles, it took a lot longer for that meat to disappear on a bison carcass. Interestingly enough, about half the edibles were gone in under two days on elk carcasses of all sorts. It took upward of seven days with a bison carcass. So the implications for bears are relatively straightforward. First of all, there's a lot more meat out there on a bison carcass to be ate. And by virtue of that, they're more likely to find that carcass and moreover find a carcass that will sustain them and a as a result of sort of that expectation we did find that fully a quarter of all bison carcasses had been exploited by grizzly bears in contrast to closer to 5% of elk carcasses. So, basic points. Bears obtain most of the meat that they eat from bison by scavenging, but bison are a disproportionately important food for grizzly bears and I would argue probably always have been anywhere that bison and grizzlies shared space. So with that foundational notion in mind, let's start on a shared journey, uh, tracing where bears and grizzly bears were through an arc of time and space going back into the Ice Ages, the Pleistocene. But this is gonna be a drama in seven acts, and um, at least the first part of my talk. And so it behooves me then to set the stage. In each of these maps that follows, there will be common features. So this is North America in the main. These arrows point to the North Pole. Everything in white at each time step represents the area covered by continental ice sheets. Everything that's dusky green are the areas of land that were exposed by virtue of lower sea level, that water caught up in the ice caps. And one of the featured land masses will be Beringia, which is the land mass that was exposed during the ice ages by the lower sea level, connecting Eurasia to North America in one supercontinent, differentiating Western from Eastern Beringia because Eastern Beringia was always a more productive environment at least for animals like grizzly bears and bison, but also differentiating shrub tundra from steppe or polar tundra. The reason, reason being that steppe tundra was always a more productive environment for herbivores that grazed, like woolly rhinos, woolly mammoths, and bison. By contrast, shrub tundra is an incredibly unproductive environment for a grazer, but parenthetically, just fine habitat for a species like a grizzly bear that can subsist on the berries produced by shrubs. Turning to the cast, uh, bison for sure. All the different morphotypes that we had at one time on North America, ranging from the truly enormous bison latifrons furthest to the left, a six foot span of horns, to our relatively dwarfish modern day bison furthest to the right, and in the middle, the ancestor of them all, steppe bison, bison priscus. Turning to the bears, the main protagonist for sure is Ursus arctus, the grizzly or brown bear. Making a cameo appearance is the giant short-faced bear, Arctotus saima, standing six feet at the shoulder and very much able to kill a grizzly bear. So a potential predator on bears as well as bison. So with that in mind, I take you back to the Illinoisan, which is the ice age next before the last one, about 150,000 years ago. 
And this point in time is relevant because this is when bison first arrived in North America from Eurasia in the form of steppe bison. And there they joined an existing bestiary of large herbivores, such as the woolly mammoth, reindeer, horses, muskox. But not too long after the arrival of bison in eastern Beringia, about 25,000 years after that, we're into the next warm period before the one we're in now, a warm period called the Sangamonian, at a time when the ice sheets were in rapid retreat and ice-free corridors had opened, connecting Beringia to mid-latitudes. And it's through the ice-free corridor then that bison were able to slip south to mid-latitudes, take up residence, not long after that, bison to the north were isolated from bison to the south by closure of the boreal forest, which is truly inhospitable habitat for a creature like the bison. But by virtue of that isolation to the south, steppe bison were able to evolve into the giant bison latifrons which coexisted with yet another bestiary of truly large herbivores to the south. Colombian mammoths, mastodonts, camels, horses again, and a truly strange animal called stag deer or cervalces. So let's fast forward again through several millennia into the last ice age, the Wisconsinan, to about 70 to 55,000 years ago, and this point in time matters because it's when grizzly bears first arrived. Comprised of three different genetic lineages, clades two, three, and four, you can think of a clade as roughly approximating a subspecies. Now it was during this early part of the last ice age that we had these fleeting ephemeral ice-free corridors open up between the Cordilleran ice sheet to the west, the Laurentide ice sheet to the east. But it was during one of these episodes that grizzly bears were able to slip south to mid-latitudes and take up residence, but representing only one genetic lineage, clade four. And shortly after those grizzly bears arrived, the door literally and figuratively slammed shut during the last glacial maximum, isolating grizzlies to the north from grizzlies to the south. But then around that time, something is interesting happened. Grizzly bears in Beringia, in eastern Beringia, went extinct. At the same time that we had a burgeoning of giant short-faced bear populations. And there have been more than a few people have speculated that the demise of grizzlies was linked to not only competition from giant short-faced bears, but also to outright predation. But the grizzlies to the south didn't have it easy. They were trying to find a niche in the midst of a truly formidable bestiary of large carnivores. Um, here represented pretty much in toto in this picture. You had, again, the giant short-faced bear. You had a different species of short-faced bear. You had the Florida cave bear. You had the dire wolf. When we look at the cats, we had our version of the lion. We had the dirk tooth cat. We had the saber tooth cat. We even had our version of a cheetah. And the largest of these carnivores could definitely have killed a grizzly bear. So I envision grizzlies as leading a relatively furtive existence on the edges during the middle of the ice ages. And of course, all of these large carnivores, to some extent, were subsisting on meat from the large herbivores. So we're sprinting through the millennia here, leaving the ice age behind, entering into our current warm epoch, the Holocene, about 13,000 years ago. By 11,500 years ago, again, the ice sheets were in rapid retreat. Notably, for our history, we had a recolonization of eastern Beringia by two new waves of colonizing grizzly bears, but all of a single genetic lineage, clade three, at the same time that giant short-faced bears disappeared. But something even more apocalyptic was happening about then. We went from a bestiary, a menagerie that looked something like this at the height of the last ice age, 
to this by about 10,000 years ago. So the largest left standing in the wake of these extinctions were bison and grizzly bears. And by that time, bison had evolved yet more into different morphotypes. To the north, we had a type that's a recent derivative of the steppe bison that's called bison occidentalis by the paleontologist. To the south, we had a form called bison antiquus. But notably, we had two different genetic lineages of bison and grizzly bears differentiated by being in the north versus the south. And as the ice sheets melted and an ice-free corridor opened up, as you would expect, the bison and grizzlies from the north moved south, the bison and grizzlies from the south moved north, and they met and mixed in what is now central Alberta. But importantly, the bison and grizzlies from the north never got any further south. The implication of that is that all of the bison that live at mid-latitudes in North America, that did live at mid-latitudes in North America, descended from bison antiquus. And all of the grizzly bears that lived south of southern Alberta and southeastern BC into Mexico were of this clade four lineage, a truly um, unique lineage of bears. Now, the important thing to note, too, is that clade four grizzlies went extinct everywhere else on Earth but in this part of the world, with the exception of one small remnant of clade four bears that hangs on in Hokkaido. So again, fast forwarding through several very fascinating millennia um, to say circa 1400 AD, somewhere around there, what you see in green is the reconstructed distribution of grizzly bears after a certain amount of waxing and waning. Now this distribution represents certain anomalies, like why weren't grizzly bears further east in any numbers in the boreal forests? They can do just fine in the boreal forests of Eurasia, but that's a whole nother talk. What's relevant to this story though is the anomaly at mid-latitudes. Why didn't we have grizzlies in our eastern deciduous forests? And yet brown bears, do just fine in deciduous forests in Europe. So it turns out that that eastern margin of the grizzly bear distribution coincides almost exactly with the transition from short and mid-grass to tall grass prairie. So the focus is then on the prairies, the Great Plains, the tall grass prairie in particular, the question being what was going on there? that made life difficult for grizzlies. Well, I suspect that tall grass prairie is only indirectly implicated. I think what was more of a factor has to do with the other large bodied omnivores on this continent, specifically people, for one. Humans have always existed at their highest densities at mid-latitudes in the eastern deciduous forests. This is going back 13,000 years or more. And humans were not only learning from bears, but they were competing for shared foods. And humans were meeting out a certain amount of mortality um, in defense of life and property, if you will, and for other reasons. But also, notably, it's in the eastern deciduous forests that densities of black bears have always been highest. So here again, you have another competitor for shared foods to the east. Now, what would have intensified this competition is where the shared foods were concentrated, which was along these west to east trending river corridors. And so the foods that were being competed for, very briefly, the smorgasbord, uh, berries for sure, buffalo berry, choke cherry, service berry, plums, breadroot to a certain extent, meat from ungulates like elk and bison. But when you look at what 
define the dietary niche of bears on the Great Plains, it was scavenging bison carcasses. People weren't much interested in carrion or the remains of animals that they hadn't killed themselves, and grizzly bears can easily dominate a bison carcass to the exclusion of a black bear. So here again, we circle back to what we learned in Yellowstone, the importance of bison, not only just that, but the importance of bison as carrion. So then, that brings us to bison. And what was happening to bison? Here I'm saying bison pre-1500 AD, a pretty pregnant period of time, as you probably all know. Where were the bison for most of the Holocene? And here I've recast the physical environment from biomes of the Great Plains to just simply areas where we had an abundance of tall and short and mid grasses. What, I've sh what I show here, each one of those dots represents the remains of bison that were found dating back through the Holocene pre-1500. Not surprisingly, there's a striking correlation between bear where bison lived and where there was grass. Notice the dearth of locations from eastern North America. Now, it was different going back into the Pleistocene. We're talking about the Holocene here. And so we can generalize that distribution to look like this in the main, and within that core bison distribution. And we can then overlay on that where we had grizzly bears, so we have a joint distribution. And I would argue that everywhere within that area of overlap, bison was an important source of food for grizzlies, if not a critical and defining food for grizzlies. And note, too, that this area of overlaps, overlap represents close to the majority of the distribution of grizzly bears at mid-latitudes. So a non-trivial trivial food. But things were not static for bison through time during the Holocene. Um, the height of these bars just show this, the abundance of different herbivores going back through time, starting at the right, at the present, back 14,000 years farthest left. The dark brown shows the relative abundance of bison during that time period. Orange shows the relative abundance of other mega herbivores, which were rapidly going extinct, pretty much gone by about 9,000 years ago. Now, you would expect, with all of those competitors for shared forage having disappeared, that you would have an explosion of bison numbers, but you didn't not until about 3,000 years ago. So it begs the question, why not? And I think it has a lot to do with what was going on with the mid-Holocene climate, probably drought. And as it turns out, we had some epic, epic mega droughts during the middle of the Holocene. The intensity of each one of those vertical orange bars corresponds to the intensity of drought. The most epic of droughts has been called the Alta Thermal, and I have no doubt that, that dr those drought conditions and the relatively poor forage that arose from that kept bison numbers depressed. But something else was going on with bison through time. They were getting smaller. Each one of those dots is a reconstruction of the size of the bison based upon the skeletal remains that have been found. So you can see that they're getting smaller. And we lost the truly largest forms of bison right with the start of the altothermal drought. So with that in mind, it's also probably not surprising that there's good evidence that bison disappeared altogether at different times from the southern plains, and that for most of the middle part of the Holocene, grizzly bears were absent from the middle and southern Great Plains. So a truly a time of hardship for both bison and grizzlies on the North American continent, and contributing to explaining why grizzly bears were not able to successfully colonize the East. So one final thing going on of relevance to understanding what was happening to bison, what was happening to grizzly bears, and it has to do with something fairly arcane. It's the distinction between C3 and C4 grasses. Now this just refers to two different photosynthetic pathways. 
but with great ramifications for animals like bison. C4 grasses are much less nutritious and they tend to favor warm conditions. So here's the boundary between C4 dominated grasslands to the south versus C3 dominated grasslands to the north. During the Ice Age, C4 grasses, if you know your grasses, are blue grama grass, buffalo grass. The C3 grasses are fescue, bluegrass, wheatgrass. Now, given that C4 grasses do better in warmer climes, it's not surprising with the warming that accompanied the Holocene that this boundary between C3 and C4 grasses migrated northward. And so compounding all of what was happening, the drought, we had a diminishment in carrying capacity of the grasslands and the central plains during the course of the Holocene. So here's that distribution for roughly the period of 500 to 1,000 years ago. But if we go back before that, into the middle Holocene, before 1,000 years ago, we go from a core that looks like that and a total distribution that looks like that to something more like that. So we had a considerable shrinkage um, in the distribution of bison, but also where bison were most abundant. And we can, in a, sketchily, in a sketchy sort of way, reconstruct where we also had grizzly bears, noting first that bison at times were entirely absent from the southern plains. But you can see as well, we had a much more restricted area of overlap between bison and grizzly bears. But note where this boundary between C3 and C4 grass, grasslands lies. And I reconstructed these boundaries, each one independent of the other. But it's just striking. I mean, this, the easternmost boundary of where we had grizzly bears is really telling us where bison were most abundant, which was in these areas farther to the north. Again, telling us that the northern Great Plains were probably always the most productive in terms of numbers of bison as well as numbers of grizzly bears. Now, I'm bringing people back into the picture here. Prior to the introduction of horses by Spaniards, the only way that people could kill bison was pursuing them on foot, or they could make use of topography and other artifices to kill bison. So we have record of mass kills being made, of bison being driven over cliffs, of bison being driven into arroyos and trapped and then killed, of bison even being killed after being driven into corrals that people made, what are called pounds. So these kills could have ranged from anywhere uh, a couple of dozen to hundreds of animals at a time. There's evidence that because there was such an abundance of dead bison, that people engaged in what's called gourmet butchering, taking the choicest cuts and leaving the remainder. Some of the carcasses were not touched at all at the bottom of a pile. But the implications for grizzly bears are pretty obvious. As scavengers, people were recreating lots of of edibles for grizzly bears. And it's not too hard to imagine these scenarios where people are frantically butchering as quickly as they can to get as much meat as possible to take and preserve. At the same time that grizzlies are circling around the edges, this negotiation of time and space happening. And I have no doubt that there were occasions when grizzly bears had the upper hand. So each one of these dots represents a documented mass kill site. Um, red, and it's the totality of all the sites that we know about. Um, the red are jumps, the yellow are royal traps, the orange are pounds. Notice where the concentration is. In the northern plains, in these plains that were dominated by the C3 grasses, where carrying capacity was probably always highest where bison were probably always most abundant. And notice again the coincidence between the easternmost distribution of grizzly bears and the easternmost distribution of these mass kill sites. So I don't think there's any coincidence there. 
So leaving the fascinating times of the Holocene pre-Anthropocene behind, we arrive at the arrival of Europeans on this continent, the Anthropocene. And for good or for bad, this is largely a story of extirpation and loss, at least when we look at bison and grizzly bears. And briefly then, looking at the extirpation, starting with grizzly bears. For the contiguous US, everything in green is where I reconstruct. We had grizzly bears around 1800, which is when grizzlies were first encountering significant numbers of Europeans. By 1850, grizzly bears had been extirpated from the central and southern plains. A short 60 years after that, they had been extirpated from roughly 90% of all the places they had once lived, reduced to these scattered, small populations represented in green. Each, a lot of these populations were probably no more than a handful of bears at that time. 60 years after that, we were left with largely what we have now, 98% of all the grizzly bears extirpated in all the places they once lived. Most of the bears remaining in the northern continent of Levide and Greater Yellowstone, which is where we have them now. A few in the North Cascades, a few in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado. Turning to bison, the story is a little more complicated, but because of that, a little, uh, to, from my perspective, a bit more fascinating. Um, here again is the core of bison distribution, say, around 1500. Now, something really interesting happened between 1500 and 1600. We went from this to that. We actually had an increase in the distribution and abundance of bison. And for the first time ever, we had significant numbers of bison showing up in the east, each documented in uh, instant instance represented by a dot. So it begs the question of what was going on? Well, obviously, 1500 AD is a demarcation. Before that, there were no Europeans. After that, there were. But well in advance of the Europeans as such, there were European diseases. And the best available evidence suggests that between 1500 and 1600 in the eastern United States, what was to become the eastern United States, 50 to 80 percent of all the people that lived there died from disease. So practically, when we look at bison, there were many, many fewer people that there to potentially prey on bison, but also in company with this decline in human densities, there was a change in economy to where, a, a yet again, again, after a long period of time when agriculture was, had precedence, people were relying more on big game. And so, for that reason, they were burning a lot more. Burning to create more grass in the, in the understory, to um, favor big game populations. And of course, all of this would have benefited bison. So around 1650, this is probably what we had in terms of a bison distribution, core and periphery. Less than two centuries after that, though, Europeans had started to take a pretty dramatic toll. Bison were almost completely gone from the eastern US. Within 10 years, they were completely gone. 50 years after that, bison had been extirpated from roughly 75% of all the places they had once lived. I mean, most people have this conception that the major extirpations of bison didn't begin until around 1870. Actually, most of it had already occurred by then. And the remaining bison had been separated into the great northern and southern herds by the newly built transcontinental railroad. 10 years later, Nine years after that, bison were re reduced to a few scattered herds of a few dozen animals at most, a couple hundred in Yellowstone. A few years after that, basically the only place where we still had wild bison was in Yellowstone, a 99% loss. And when we cast that in terms of the area of bison-grizzly bear overlap, we went from this to that. 
less than 1% of what we once had. In Yellowstone. Now, the reasons for these rapid and widespread extirpations are not too mysterious. It had to do with well-armed Europeans with bad attitudes informed by narratives, specifically narratives, at least in the minds of our European ancestors, narratives which gave them permission to perpetrate genocides. A bison, a people, So, at the end, here we are at Yellowstone. If there is any future, it's going to be because of what we do with bears and bison in Yellowstone. And a lot has been happening in this ecosystem in the last 20 or 30 years. At one time, say 20 years ago, grizzly bears in this ecosystem subsisted largely on four different foods or food groups. The seeds of white bark pine, army cutworm moths that they ate while the moths were concentrated in talus slopes in the alpine, cutthroat trout that they caught while spawning in streams tributary to Yellowstone Lake, and meat from bison and elk. Now, within the last 20 years, though, cutthroat trout have been functionally extirpated as a bear food. We've lost 70% or so of the cone producing white bark pine in the ecosystem to a outbreak of bark beetles driven by climate warming. And in compensation, bears are eating more moths, but more importantly for our story, they're eating more meat. And for the first time ever, substantial amounts of meat from livestock, not surprising when they're scrambling to try to compensate for what they've lost. And with this greater reliance on meat, here looking at trends in mortality, but first of all flagging that this area of orange represents the culmination of the losses of white bark pine and cutthroat trout going from 2002 on the left to the present on the right. The burgundy just shows the number of bears that died during a given year because of conflicts with humans over meat. And that was primarily ranchers, because bears were preying on cattle or scavenging cattle. And with big game hunters, because bears were increasingly seeking out gut piles and therefore spending more time around hunters, encountering them under circumstances where hunters felt like they needed to kill bears in defense of life and property. But this increase in meat-related mortalities in turn drove a fairly dramatic increase in total mortality. And what was happening with estimated numbers of live bears in the ecosystem? These two squiggly lines represent just simply two different metrics by which we monitor population size. So the gray and the black. Notably, there has been no increase in population size for the last 15 years, certainly not since the culmination of the losses of white bark pine and cutthroat trout, and evidence that we started into a downturn. And because of lag effects built into the system, that downturn will probably become more pronounced in the next few years. So not a particularly auspicious time in terms of these larger trends for grizzly bears. And so interestingly enough, it, it, it as is at this very time that the Fish and Wildlife Service has moved ahead with removing Endangered Species Act protections for grizzly bears, which they did. Authority then was turned over to the states. The states of Wyoming and Idaho then aggressively moving forward with a sport hunt scheduled to begin August 1st of this year, slated to kill 23 bears. And what's been happening with bison in this ecosystem? Everything you see in brown represents the main part of the distribution of our bison herds in Yellowstone, three different herds. The two herds for the south, the central bison herd, the Jackson bison herd. Both herds increased for a period of time, but recently they've declined sharply, especially the central bison herd. An exception to that is what's been going on with the northern bison herd on the northern range. 
It is the one place where we've seen an increase in the abundance of a large herbivore in the Yellowstone ecosystem at the same time that elk numbers have plummeted. So we can aggregate the numbers for the, at least the Yellowstone bison, and this is what we come up with as a population trend, steadily more or less upward. But it's strange when we look at what's been going on with numbers of carcasses on ungulate winter ranges, numbers of bison car carcasses. You would expect that if numbers of live bison were increasing, you, the number of carcasses would also be increasing. But that's not what we've seen. We've seen an uncoupling. We saw a fairly dramatic decline, and then it's bottomed out. So it begs the question of why has there been this uncoupling between numbers of live bison and numbers of bison on the ground that are available as carrion for scavengers like grizzly bears. And it has to do with the auspices under which we're managing bison in the Yellowstone ecosystem under terms of the interagency bison management plan, which is designed to minimize the chance or threat of the spread of the disease brucellosis from bison to cattle, realizing that bison got that disease from cattle in the first place. But this management is remarkably lethal, and it involves humans killing a lot of bison. As it turns out, 90% of all the adult bison that die are killed by a human. And these are animals that spend most of their lives inside of national parks. So what does that human-caused mortality look like through time? these really strange pulses that have to do with the vagaries of the politics surrounding bison management, but three peaks, each one higher than the last. But it's interesting then to match those peaks in human-caused mortality with what's been happening with numbers of live bison in the population, an almost perfect match. So we, are, we humans, in terms of the numbers of bison we're, we are killing, are driving what's happening with the population. And moreover, we are taking all this biomass out of the ecosystem and rendering it unavailable to animals like grizzly bears that are increasingly reliant on meat. And all of this is being carried out under the premise that there are too many bison, that there are too many grizzlies which I find a, to be a remarkable proposition. For example, let's contrast the numbers of grizzly bears in the Yellowstone ecosystem, 700 to 1,000, relative to another large-bodied omnivore, humans. There are 320,000 of us in this presumed most wild of the wild ecosystems left in the contiguous U.S. Likewise, we have 5,400 bison or so. We have 438,000 cows in the Yellowstone ecosystem alone. Hmm. But I think what is even more to the point is that these few bears and these few bison together represent less than 1% of what we once had on this continent. But let's scale that up and look at what we once had in the Northern Hemisphere, here represented in green. This is what we've got, less than one-tenth of 1%. But more to the point, you know, I mean, people may throw up their hands and say, we don't have room for any more. Well, I would argue that we have room for lots more grizzlies and lots more bison. We have the tools in the toolbox as a practical matter to facilitate coexistence. But I think in the end, what it's going to come down to is the stories we tell ourselves. What's going on, as Louisa said, between our ears whether we continue to tell ourselves 
these legacy stories that our European ancestors brought to this continent of domination and use, of violence and intolerance, or whether, as we are, we increasingly are telling ourselves stories of benevolence, compassion, accommodation, respect, relatedness. So I'll leave you with that thought. So I guess if there are any questions, I'd be happy to field them. Uh, if there's questions for Johnny as well. I have a question. Yeah. About uh, the bison I've seen in northern BC. Yeah. What is that? Well, there's, there's a lot of debate over the taxonomy of, <coughs> of bison to the north there. Bison, bison, Athabasca is a sub, what's called a subspecies. The taxonomists have a field day with this stuff, right? Uh, there's, there's genetic differences between our bison here and those bison there. And there's some thought that those bison further north are, <coughs> have retained some of the genes of those uh, the set bison, the bison that can tell us. Um, it's not clear sort of the history of, of those bison to the ones we have. Most of the bison on this continent were descendants of bison. <coughs> Could you speak a little to the importance of connectivity between isolated current grizzly populations? Oh, insofar as grizzlies are concerned, um, it, it's intrinsically a problem that the population in Yellowstone is isolated from bears anywhere else. They have the um, lowest genetic heterozygosity or variation of any mainland grizzly bear population. So that means genetic health should be a concern. Um, and research that's been done, say, since the mid-1990s has, has shown that to ensure long-term population health, genetic health, viability, if you will, we need something like eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 grizzlies. And most people, when I say that, um, raise their eyebrows. Like, you've got to be kidding. How can we ever have eight, nine, ten thousand grizzly bears? Um, well, we can support three hundred and twenty-eight thousand people in the study of the system for God's sake. But, but as a practical matter, we can support that many more grizzlies. Um, there's been lots of modeling to show where the, habit, the suitable habitat lays, and there's lots of suitable habitat yet in the Northern Rockies, sufficiently productive, sufficiently remote. Um, and again, we have the tools by which we can coexist with grizzlies. We just have to deploy them. The only way we'll do that, though, is if we have a different attitude, if we're more tolerant and more willing to uh, do what's required. Um, anyway, I'm optimistic that if we give bears a chance, they will show us with their feet what connectivity kind of looks like. And we will be able to accommodate them. And we could have grizzly bears from Yellowstone all the way up to Alaska. You know, not in a way that dominates the earth and excludes humans, but that actually where we are able to live with them. I mean, well, and Louisa would probably could tell, you know, say more along those lines. She likes to talk about Romania. I don't know if any of you have been to Romania. They've got 6,000 brown bears, which are the same species. Maybe not quite as aggressive as our grizzlies, but not that much different. They've got 6,000 brown bears, grizzlies, in a smaller country surrounded by thousands and thousands, millions of people. So we can always look to Romania. <coughs> and I, I, can't, I can't see the hands very well, so I don't know who put up their hands. Okay, I got a question. Oh, okay. uh, Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. I mean, I couldn't agree more with you, so thank you. Um, and I absolutely agree that we, need, we as, as a species, need to change from 
a sense of uh, domination to you know, <laughs> compassion and connectedness with other living beings and with the habitat and everything. However, in a more practical sense, our state, wild, state wildlife agencies clearly manage wild animals simply for the purpose of, uh, of getting killed. You know, I mean, state wildlife agencies manage wild animals for hunters, for trophy hunters, for trappers, for anglers. How are we going to get, uh, how, we, how are we going to change that focus of the wildlife agencies managing for a minority of the American population towards, you know, the American public, where we actually, who are not in support of killing animals, have a voice in how animals are being so-called, in quotes, managed. How are we going to do that? Any, any ideas? All right, uh, good point. I think, that's, I think that's another issue. Um, I have lots of ideas about that, and there are others in this room that have lots of ideas about it. I know. Pro probably more than we could uh, get into uh, at this moment. But I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the population of Chris Lakes and the San Juans, and that's, this is the first I've heard of that. Do you have any idea how large that population is? Uh, all evidence is that they are now gone. The last no grizzly was killed in, I think it was 1979. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Rick Bass has written a book about it here. He said in the second row. Um, so they were definitely there up until 1979, but by, by the odds, not since then. So, but, but you know, it go, what speaks to the fact that there's product, sufficiently productive habitat and remote habitat, it's just when these populations get to such a small size, these dynamics are entrained that make you know, it irreversible as to where things are headed. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Northern Plains, can you please talk about um, bison restoration on the Northern Plains? Uh, people are beginning to look towards that. Um, I know there's American Prairie Reserve. Um, and other, even the, the um, Charlie Russell a Wildlife Refuge is interested in bison restoration and the importance to grizzly bear recovery um, across that area. And also from the south, um, the mule deer migrations, will that have any influence on um, food source for the Grady Yellowstone? For the grizzly bears in Grizzly? Yeah. Because I know your charts had that be a very minor, you know. But, you know, with that. I, I'll speak to the surgeons. last part of your comment first. Okay. Um, the smaller the size of the ungulate species, the less beneficial it is for bears. Because yeah. they always exist in low densities. They're always in competition with other scavengers. And if nothing else, coyotes. And so when a small ungulate dies, odds are everything's going to be gone. I mean, as I believe you said, I studied mountain lions. 99%, uh, I mean, when I'm talking about scavenging, 99% of the mule deer could be gone in three days. So uh, it, it, it's the size, the mass of the herbivore that matters to bears as scavengers. Not the numbers. Yeah, not, not so much the numbers. Although, it, you know, I mean, gut piles are a different matter. In northwestern Montana, uh, grizzly bears scavenge a lot of uh, white-tailed deer gut piles in the wake of hunting season. So, you know, these nuances matter. Uh, insofar as the first part of your comment, um, I think you basically made a good point. And I, I, the only thing I can do is just reflect on having grown up in western South Dakota, um, you know, claiming, by God, I'm a fourth generation of South Dakota, you know, which to somebody like Johnny this probably sounds a little ridiculous. But <laughs> anyway, we, we white folks like to kind of brag on that kind of stuff. Anyway. But anyway, but the point is, ranching families. And just looking at the hardship of people on the plains 
trying to make a living raising cows. There's got to be a better way. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying grossly, but, um, you know, I, I think there's, you know, just as a practical measure, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of dimensions to this issue of how we deal with bison, as wild, as domesticated, how we go about it. But just as a practical matter, um, and a lot of a lot of great points. It's it's a really economically tenuous proposition to be raising cows. And, and given the C three C four grassland boundary migration and climate change, does that increase the importance of, of it going plains? Yeah, but it's very predictable that this boundary will shift from the northern part. Yeah, carrying capacity will decline. We'll enter into something analogous to the alpha federal drought. We're probably looking at thousands of years of pretty harsh conditions. And nobody did very well at that time. Uh, yeah, so that's yes, Dr. Uh, I'm Colonel Barbie. I'm, uh, I belong to the uh, Montana Bio Association. Um, would you mind giving this uh, some lecture in January? In January? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, I. I, I I'm gratified to hear you even ask that. Um, I, I love talking about the story. Of education and motivation. Yeah, well, sure. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I'm, I'm flattered that you even um, asked that. Yeah. Um, I was uh, wanting to talk about, or hear your thoughts on, maybe Mr. Arley can speak to this as well. Uh, is there a problem with the coexistence for civilization with uh, the, the bear? You know, like people managed to live with bears relatively, it seems, peacefully, and now we keep building roads and things and disintegrating habitat and having sort of hostile relationship with the bear. Like, how do we uh, how do we relate to the bear better? <laughs> well, I think we had a comment. You know, we're, we're all educated, I think, you know. I've got part, but I think the bears need to be educated, too, you know. Send them to school, you know. <laughs> Let them know that this is my land, see this fence here, no trespass. <laughs> <laughs> they walk out of the Yellowstone, you know, and they go over that fence, and all of a sudden they're terrorizing everybody, checking everybody's garbage up. It's our fault. We just need to get to be with them. Just like I said before with the animals before. The, the people had faith in the animals. They weren't scared of them when they were 12 years old. They sent them to the mountains without any weapons, without any food, to fast. Under a fast, the family home or hoping that this child will get gifted by an animal that will give him a song, something for him to keep that he can use. And they were had they had faith in all the animals that it was that we could get on. And nobody was scared. And today's life we're just we're afraid. Everybody's afraid of something. You know, they show things on the movie the shark wild buffalo, bears, you say shark, ooh, stay out of the water. They're all, <laughs> they're all there. They just know our sense of a feeling, a good feeling, a good heart. You go in the, in the woods with a good heart, great sense of your dog knows it. You know, if you have a good feeling, your dog knows We just kind of have to change our, our lives in order for the, for the animals to kind of recognize us, know us all. We live in harmony. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> so I got carried away. As a, as a, as a white honky, I could kind of paraphrase some of that given my own experience. <laughs> Uh, 
which is it, that oh, it, I felt like I did not belong out amongst grizzly bears if I wasn't down here. And you know, I don't, you know, I don't know if that again is a, any any answer to this larger question of, of sharing space in a, in a way that's really benevolent. And it's not being about being foolish. It's not about being silly. Not 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 thinking that a bear couldn't tear your head off if it wanted to. But you, I think yeah, you, you, can, you can live in a way. You can you can be in the world in a way that it feels good to be that way, I think. You know, to be down in, in here. And I don't know much other way to talk about it. Um, I'm curious as to how many times you have if or not um, have you presented or supplied the findings to like, um, fishing department? <laughs> I mean, any, any findings of any shape? or sort, uh, many, many, many times. Is it, do they, is it based on them requesting, or is it based on you just? Requesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I think, uh, I don't know, sort of a, 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 a I'm trying to divine some of what's behind that question. Uh, for example, in, in, I was doing uh, mountain lion research down in the southwest, and um, Wildlife Services invited me to come and talk about mountain lions. And I think, you know, it, it's the nature of science. It's sort of the way we orient to the world these days, which is just one way. Um, but I, I was up there talking about these lions, and through the portal of, of science, the lives they led, and just how fascinating. And these, these guys, Wildlife Services, I don't know if you know what Wildlife Services is. They're the, the people that are paid to go out and kill animals. They were just riveted. They were fascinated by the lives of these animals. And so, you know, I think that's part of the way in, is to, to connect people, to, to, to awaken the empathy in them that's there. You know, despite the claims that, or that somehow we anthropomorphize too much. I mean, John is uh, talking about uh, relatedness and, 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 and understanding. I, I, you know, I, I think there's no way forward for any of us without empathy and compassion. <coughs> No, it, it, takes, Not that long? it takes closer to, to 10 to 13 years. Okay, I'm wrong. No, in terms of a female to replace herself with oh. a, a successfully reproducing daughter. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's yeah. So the fear of those grizzly bears, I mean, I, I think that number should be um, is shared with people, to educate them. That, that's how long, one grizzly bear, that's how long it takes to replace that. Grizzly bear populations typically are on the knife edge, between going down versus um, you know, persistent. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Johnny.
also Tim Presto and Josh Pearl with Dirty Justice. We got a 15 minute break and then we'll be back with Rick Bass and introducing a Peacock Sport, which is a fabulous one you haven't seen. So, thank you very much. Well, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to have the opportunity and privilege to introduce Rick Bass. Uh, but before I do that, I don't know if Blake Nicolazzo is here. I just want to give her a little shout out. She's done such a great job organizing everything. Blake, where are you? Yeah. I don't know when I first met Rick, but I don't think I ever would have appreciated his Yak Valley were it not for him. And I certainly wouldn't have appreciated in the same detailed way the importance of all of these sort of knees and elbows of this landscape, sort of secret landscapes in some ways, but intimate landscapes uh, that of course the grizzly bear and we know well. And Rick is an accomplished author, actually, in this audience. He needs no introduction. Um, but I just want to thank you, Rick, for being here tonight and for introducing this fabulous film about our mutual friend, dear friend, uh, Doug Peacock, uh, Vietnam veteran Green Beret, uh, who regained sanity, as we all do, uh, in the company of grizzlies, in the company of some of the wildest places we have left and it's worth fighting for. So thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Louisa. Um, Johnny, David, <coughs> Blake, everyone, is this your phone? Yeah. Okay, so you want to <laughs> uh, I'm gonna squint. Is there a way to get a little bit of light here. Lights on the, the Thank you so place. much. Um, I scribbled, and I can't read my handwriting in, in daylight, much less in, in dimness. Uh, welcome to Grizzly Week. Oh, I'm wearing a cap like it's really rude, but it's, it says save the Yellowstone Grizzly, so if you'll forgive me for that. It's, uh, welcome to Grizzly Week in Missoula. It's the real deal, not the sweating boys in Maroon. It's an honor, thank you. It's an honor to be here as Montana hears the federal case about the non-scientific political errors in prematurely delisting the Yellowstone ecosystem's grizzlies, which has exposed Montana's grizzlies to the trophy hunters in Idaho and Wyoming in utterly unscientific fashion, targeting the precise individuals who seek to disperse and establish the corridors of connectivity requisite for the survival of the species. It's an honor to visit with people like John R. Lee, the CSKT, who were the original caretakers of the Grizzlies of the Yak Valley, where once upon a time there were assuredly more than three or four breeding females with cubs, as is now the case, tight roping back and forth into Canada, and now dodging dozens and imminently hundreds of food hikers and campers directed by the Pacific Northwest Trail into what was previously the Yak Grizzlies' designated core habitat. We're fortunate to have Doug Leffler, ethical hunter and grizzly advocate, and Deidre and Judy of Shoot Them With a Camera, the creator of the program that successfully secured a third of Wyoming's annual grizzly bear permits by people who probably will decide not to shoot a grizzly should they be fortunate enough to see one. Let's remember the 12.7 million people visited Montana last year with the hopes of seeing a grizzly. Compared to 20 to 25 grizzlies isolated in the Yak, this is a very big number. Compared to the island population of Yellowstone, this is a very big number. I'm grateful for the national groups, such as Earth Justice, who are speaking for the grizzlies, the Humane Society, in the language of humans and the law, and the small, even tiny groups like Grizzly Times and Save the Yellowstone Grizzly, working to protect all grizzlies south of Canada. David Matson is if you were fortunate enough to hear his talk earlier, sees grizzly bears, the individuals, their habits and needs, distribution, demographics, and diet, with the short-term precision of an emergency room doctor, the historical perspective of a novelist, and the evolutionary perspective of a geologist. 
What's it like, I sometimes wonder, to see the grizzly, its needs, politics, and stressors with the complicated acuity of a dragonfly's ever swiveling, all-seeing vision, the fragmented world splintered like a kaleidoscope and shifting more so every day than theirs. And yet to not just see it, but know it, to understand it as David does. I'm so grateful for his independent science and his scientific testimony in this extremely political case. In Montana, science still matters. Few more revolutionary words can be uttered these days of government chaos, disarray, untruth. The Matson household is double trouble. For those who seek to kill for sport, the very individuals our government has said might and can and should disperse safely to reconnect Montana's island subpopulations, where currently the only way to get them from one ecosystem to another is to be kidnapped, put in the back of a truck, and driven there. For 40 years, Louise Wilcox has fought for the large carnivores, including wolves and grizzlies that make Montana be Montana, and not necessarily Wyoming or Idaho or even Texas or Louisiana. Working from her home in Paradise Valley on her own, she provides an invaluable resource with her dog, her dogs, her blogs and, <laughs> and national networking, often in partnership with tribes and First Nations who, shocker, are not being heard yet or fully on this issue. Their day in court, however, approaches. Louisa, like Chuck Ironstone of Save the Yellowstone Grizzlies, is as irreplaceable as a Yak Grizzly, as irreplaceable as any Grizzlies south of Canada. What you're here for at seven, Doug Peacock, where to begin? Where else but in the earth, the dirt, the soil? Growing up as a boy archeologist in Michigan, he studied maps, predicted where a huge encampment would have been. He was right. He later championed the return of the remains of the oldest known human bones in North America to their descendants, indigenous peoples. In Vietnam, he was a sapper crawling through dark tunnels of earth toward the enemy. He could smell but not see in the darkness. No grizzly bear can frighten such a warrior, and particularly not one, as Johnny R. Lee reminds us, with a warrior's heart that is filled with respect and from that love. Where there is winter, the bears still go down in the earth. Save Yellowstone Grizzlies board member Dan Sullivan calls Doug our dear teacher. Board member Terry Tempest Williams calls Doug the ethical gold standard by which wilderness is measured. Before he gets too swell headed, um, uh, the great white heart behind scientist Jesse Logan uh, reminds us that Doug is a man who's among the first to call ketchup the sauce of his people. <laughs> <laughs> Wyoming and Idaho are killing Montana's bears. A Pacific Northwest through hiker trail and campground system threatens the Yaks 20 to 25 grizzlies. None of our subpopulations south of Canada are yet connected. The only way for these populations to connect is in the back of the truck. Fires, white bark extinction, cutthroat decimation, and now a hunting season and reduced environmental regulations on the industries that the government is feeding. Uh, I'm just going to skip talking about Ryan Zinke here. <laughs> is not going to help them connect, reconnect through the beautiful filter of natural selection and the territorial imperative for dispersal that is one of the hallmarks of a truly recovered species. Save the Yellowstone Grizzly and Grizzly Times, groups like the Yak Valley Forest Council, proposing a grizzly bear ecosystem recovery area, an ERA, not a national park, not a scenic playground, but a chunk of big country where we commit to finally recovering it. 12.7 million people visiting us, 1 million of us here holding down, as Doug says, the sacred ground with our four paws. Our actions matter. Our government, in the form of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in their, can't read it, <laughs> in their rush, this word looks like environmental. Anyway, you get the drift. Idaho and Wyoming bought it quickly, eagerly. We're not buying it in Montana. In Montana, science still matters. Thank you, Roxy Theater and Jerry, for bringing this Peacock's War. More than ever, it is Montana's war. It is still ongoing. <laughs>